Hello, and welcome to The Excerpt. I'm Dana Taylor. Orcas have been making headlines this year, mostly due to some unusual interactions with boats. Last month, they sank a yacht in the Strait of Gibraltar, one of several times they've sunk a vessel over the past few years. The question is why? Orcas have highly complex social structures. Can studying their interactions with boats help us understand them better? Joining us now to discuss these highly intelligent and social marine mammals is Michael Weiss, Research Director at the Center for Whale Research. Thanks for being on the excerpt, Michael. Yeah, thanks for having me. So I mentioned the interactions that orcas have been having with boats, some taking aim at rudders. According to a study in the Marine Mammal Science last year, there have apparently been hundreds of interactions between orcas and boats over the last several years. Do researchers know what's causing this behavior? Yeah, I wouldn't say that researchers know. There are certainly quite a few theories and hypotheses, right? So, uh, and they range all the way from one of these animals had a negative interaction with a boat and is now reacting negatively to them to what I kind of uh, think is going on and what I what most researchers I've talked to think is going on, which is these animals have found a, a new way to play, essentially. And they're, they're very curious about the, the world they live in. They're very interested in finding new ways to mess with objects. And they, they learn from each other. So you get one whale starting to mess with boat rudders, and then the next whale picks that up, and the next whale picks it up, and soon you have a whole whole group of animals, all with this uh, novel behavior. Yeah, so I was going to ask, because I read that orcas are sort of famously known for picking up behaviors from each other, causing trends. One example was an orca that carried around a salmon on its head in Puget Sound in the 80s. What are some other unusual trends that you've come across? Yeah, so the salmon head one is great because, you know, it started with this one animal and soon the whole population of, of southern resident killer whales, which are the whales I study in Washington state, were wearing salmon on their head. There are other trends we see in these whales, um, for example, kind of uh, in the population where these um, kind of quote unquote attacks are occurring, there's whole groups of the the killer whales there, in- including the whales who are doing this interaction with the boats who learned to depredate fishing lines, uh, tuna fishing lines. So these whales, normally their natural behavior is to chase tuna, you know, kind of exhaust them and, and catch them and eat them. But a whole kind of family of these whales, a whole section of the population really learned to um, just pick the salmon right off the lines of fishermen, uh, getting an easy meal. Um, And killer whales seem to be really good at specifically learning these things that involve um, hunting and getting food. But we also see whales do less kind of useful things. There's one whale in the area that I, I do my research who has kind of become notorious for finding crab pots and other fishing gear and messing around with it and playing with it till someone sees him and thinks he's, you know, entangled and needs help. And the entanglement team is deployed and they go out to try to help the whale. And by the time they get there, he's gone and and he's doing just fine. So um, they're very good at social learning and they're very good at finding ways to get themselves into trouble. So I know that orcas are apex predators. Just this month, there were boaters in Monterey Bay, California, who watched a pod of them hunt and kill, I believe it was a mink whale. How do they hunt and how does their choice of prey vary among different pods? So like you mentioned, there are whales throughout the world that eat, you know, marine mammals, other marine mammals, including large whales. In fact, in, in off the coast of Australia, they've observed killer whales hunting full-grown blue whales, which is the largest animal on the planet. You have whales that hunt, uh, that that kind of specialize in hunting sharks, in some case, great white sharks. And then you have whales like the southern resident killer whales that I study in Washington State and British Columbia, who are salmon specialists. They're fish eaters, and they don't really eat anything else. So they eat a bunch of different things. Some whales are more specialized than others. These whales that are uh, interacting with boats are, we think, you know, maybe not specialists, but they, they seem to really like tuna. Tuna is one of the main things they eat. Um, and they learn how to hunt those things, usually from their mom or from other whales kind of in their social environment. And that can be super specialized. Well, I mentioned that orcas are known for their complex social structures. Can you give us an overview of what those structures look like? Yeah, so there's a lot of variation, but in general, the killer whales that have been studied around the world tend to be uh, matrilineal. So you tend to have social units made up of moms and their kids, and sometimes their their daughters' kids as well. 
Uh, the extreme of that is is these salmon eating whales I've been talking about, where both sons and daughters never leave their mom's group. But in general, killer whale society is very focused on the bonds between mothers and and their offspring. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about their social behaviors. How do they interact and communicate within their pods? Yeah, so killer whales generally live in a very acoustically focused environment. And you can see that in their brains, you know, the parts of their brain that are designed for processing auditory information are hugely enlarged and complicated. So you can have whales spread out over a really long distance, you know, 10 kilometers, who are still in vocal communication with each other and making these what's called pulsed, pulsed calls. These calls are often specific to natural lines and to pods. So different groups, even within the same population, sound different. And we think one of the big functions of these acoustic calls is to maintain contact between family members as they're traveling um, and sometimes spreading out over large distances. But in addition to this kind of general interaction um, with their calls, they're also really, really um, tactile and, and social. So you'll see them in these big groups spending a long period of time just rubbing on each other, playing, um, you know, pushing each other around a bit, sometimes roughhousing, especially the young whales. Well, something that I came across on your group's website that really intrigued me was that orcas are the most cosmopolitan of all marine mammals. How has that affected your ability to study their behavior? Yeah, um, as you might have been able to tell from how I've responded to all these questions, we have to be careful when we generalize, right? So we can study the populations we work on and begin to understand things about what drives their social structure and their behavior. And we can look at what people have found in other populations and start to see commonalities. But we have to be careful when we generalize in the same way we have to be careful when we talk about, you know, what is human social structure and human social behavior. It varies hugely between societies and cultures. So really just trying to find what we can that is general while, while avoiding making any uh, rash generalizations. Well, you talked about some of um, the way orcas interact with other marine species. They could be prey. But overall, what's their role in helping to maintain the balance of marine ecosystems? Yeah, so killer whales are, are, are top predators, right? So they are sitting at the top of these food chains in cases where they're eating things um, that reproduce rather quickly or are, are, you know, these kind of exploding populations. They can serve as really good kind of biological controls. That's really the, the role that top predators tend to play in ecosystems is as a control on other populations that if left without predation might explode to the point where they run out of food or they cause other populations to run out of food. Um, and, and, and disrupt kind of the, that delicate balance. So let's turn now to conservation. Our oceans are changing due to climate change. What are some of the current conservation challenges facing orcas and what efforts are being made to protect their habitats? So in general, killer whales face two large threats. One is the changing in oceans um, due to, to climate change, and that's causing you know collapses up and down the ecosystem. So like I said, killer whales are top predators. They can help regulate ecosystems, but that also means they're potentially kind of vulnerable. They're sitting kind of at that top of the pyramid. And if you start taking pieces of the food web away, they could be, you know, some of the first animals to really feel that effect. The other thing that killer whales are facing worldwide is toxins, especially persistent organic pollutants like PCBs. These are things typically used in, in manufacturing or, you know, different forms of industry that get put out into the ocean. And like their name suggests, they are persistent in the environment. They don't really go away. Um, and what happens is they end up getting taken up by, you know, small microorganisms and plants that then end up being eaten by something else and eaten by something else. And you get what's called biomagnification, where a substance that's actually quite, you know, rare or, or diluted in the ecosystem generally gets magnified at the top of the food chain and killer whales are at that tippy top. So killer whales are some of the most toxic mammals on the planet, period, um, because of this bioaccumulation. And a lot of the things they're accumulating that we've put into the environment are going to have effects mostly on their immunity and on their reproduction. Yeah. And I was going to ask, how do human activities such as overfishing impact their ecosystems? 
So there are cases where you can be, you know, the whales might be in direct competition with fisheries and these whales in the Strait of Gibraltar and around the Iberian Peninsula are also potentially in direct competition with tuna fisheries. Um, but whales can also kind of come into indirect competition with fisheries when they are, they might be eating the animals that are also, you know, relying on the same thing that fisheries do. A great example of that is the krill fishery in the Southern Ocean which krill are, you know, a huge sustaining force for um, baleen whales, for a lot of large whales. Those whales might then also be uh, killer whale prey, uh, you know, not just the large whales, but also a lot of other marine species that might also be killer whale prey. So it's really this indirect competition where humans come into competition with the things killer whales eat versus potential direct competition where we're trying to eat the same thing as the whales. Well, there's been an increase in mass stranding events, MSE, involving pilot whales. First, what is an MSC, and is this behavior something that we see with orcas? Yeah, so a mass stranding event, like the name implies, is an occasion where a large number of animals uh, simultaneously strand on land, either alive or dead. Uh, and it can be caused by a lot of things, um, and we're also not totally sure what causes all of these events. They're more common in social pelagic species like pilot whales and false killer whales. And we don't really see mass strandings in killer whales. Um, and it's it's not totally clear why we don't, given that they have actually quite similar social structure to pilot whales. Uh, they're similar size, you know, kind of similar ecological niche. But they do live in different places. They live tend to live in slightly different areas, while, while pilot whales live in kind of deep water and are deep diving species. Killer whales tend to be more associated with coasts and shoreline and, and tend to stay closer to the surface. We do see killer whale strandings. Killer whales do strand, um, uh, sometimes in very strange places. Like uh, a while ago, there was a killer whale stranded off the coast, you know, on the coast of Florida. Um, but they don't tend to strand in large numbers. You tend to kind of get one or two at a time. Okay. And then finally, Michael, what would you like people listening to understand about these incredible marine mammals? Yeah, I, I think, um, especially, you know, kind of given the what we started talking about with why killer whales have been in the news so much lately with these these interactions with boats, I, I think it's just important to understand killer whales, um, while we want to avoid anthropomorphizing them, you know, we don't want to project what we feel onto them or, you know, human feelings or emotions onto killer whales. I think it's also important to understand the ways in which they are very much like us. You know, they they live about the same amount of time as we do. They the females stop reproducing at about the same time uh, humans go through menopause. Uh, they live in these tight knit social groups that have kind of taken over the world a little bit in the same way humans have. And along those lines, they're like us in that sometimes they'll do things we don't fully understand. Sometimes they'll exhibit behaviors that aren't, you know directly related to finding food or to their immediate survival and also aren't, you know, some moralistic crusade against yachts as much as I love that narrative and think it's quite fun to talk about. Sometimes they're just animals interacting with their environment in a way they find amusing, just like, you know, why do kids in the country go cow tipping? Well, because it's because they don't have anything else to do, really. So I think it's important to understand killer whales as complicated, you know, cultural and curious animals who will behave in ways we, we don't ever fully understand. Thank you so much for joining us on the excerpt, Michael. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. Thanks for watching. I'm Dana Taylor. I'll see you next time.